Today though, Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 12. If you're there, Sam, there? Sort of online, just quickly. It'll come up on the bottom of the screen. Here we go. Verse 12, it says, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Verse 14, then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. How many know if you heard Jesus say it, you can trust Jesus is gonna do it. If he says it, he's, he's gonna do it. Verse 15, it says, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise to the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is not, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. But in the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Verse 21, Peter remembered. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Verse 22, have faith in God, Jesus answered. I wanna use this text uh, today and I wanna preach from this subject, when God gets mad. Are you encouraged yet? <laughs> How many out there, you ever, get, you ever get angry? Come on, somebody, just right there in the chat, let me know what, what do you get angry about? Um, anyone like me that when you get angry, you do stupid stuff? You, you, you say stupid stuff, you see red. Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of curious even right now at Somi. I want to know in the chat as well, like, what are some of your coping mechanisms when you get angry? Uh, can I just be vulnerable? Anyone ever been in a car all by yourself and you just scream? <laughs> just, just me? Okay, a few of us just, just, we do weird stuff. But my problem with anger is I get angry, but like, I don't have enough endurance to stay angry. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, you get mad but then like it took so much energy to get there. It's like hard to stay there, you know? Try to prove a point, but like, it's like I'm not angry anymore, but I, I should be, you know? Uh, recently, uh, I got angry about something. I'm not proud of it, but I just, every once in a while, I like to use the pulpit as a, as a confessional booth. And so today I'm, I'm gonna do that with you. Uh, my wife and I, we, we moved into a, a new house not too long ago. And so we, we bought a bunch of new furniture and um, I was really excited about this. I've been waiting to get this furniture. And so I purchased like a new couch and all these new chairs. And I won't say the website name or the furniture company, maybe, maybe in person throughout the day, I, I might. But, but anyways, I order all this furniture. I ordered it in November. And, and, and dude, it's, it's May, okay? It's May. So just do the math. We're talking six months. Now they told me when I purchased it, it was going to be eight weeks. They didn't tell me six months. And so after the first delay, um, I brought it to the company's attention because I just want to do my part, right? I want to make people better. I want to let them be better. I want to give people a chance to get better. I want to give people an opportunity to right the wrong. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. So I wrote a nice email, you know, hey, excuse me. It's been, you know, three and a half months. Um, I don't have nothing yet, you know? And so they called me and they were really nice on the phone. Oh my goodness, Mr. Wilkers, we're so sorry. You're a valued customer. You've done so much business with us. We love you. We know you. It's all lying, you know? And so they tell me, hey, just, it's going to be there in two weeks. Well, how many, has this ever happened before that someone tells you it's going to be two weeks, but like two weeks just keeps coming and going and coming and going. So I'm not proud of this, but there was just began to be, you know, inter it became a weekly route. Like Mondays, I finished my meetings and then on the way home, I'd be like, oh, I got to call the furniture company to see how much longer they're going to delay me. It was a part of my life, okay? <laughs> disappointment was a, it was a rhythm of my life. Like I'm prepping myself for disappointment. And so like, just do, I don't know, man, just like, I don't know. I'm not proud of it, man. I'm just a man. And so I just got more and more frustrated and finally, and, you know, it was last week, um, two weeks ago, I'm, I'm writing an email and like, I was angry. I was angry. And I wrote this email and I'm like, that's it, you know? 
<laughs> you know, when you have no power, all you can do is like write another email, you know? And so I'm like, that's it. You have, for- <laughs> you have forced my hand. <laughs> you have forced my hand. I am now going to, ha- I hate, I said, I hate to do this, but you have forced my hand. I'm going to have to leave a negative review about your company. How many know you have, you have stooped to low places when you are threatening people with negative reviews? And I, I hit the, you ever hit the send? You're like, why did I send that? Because now I'm just barking like, I know I'm not going online anywhere, putting my name and actually giving a negative. I'm not that guy. I just can't leave negative comments. And so about two days later, conviction hit me because the furniture finally showed up. And as it showed up, I'm sitting there putting my stuff together. And I just got convicted. I said, that's it. I wrote the company an apology. I said, hey, I'm so sorry. I kind of overreacted. I'm silly. Uh, Jesus loves me and he definitely loves you. And I have decided to withdraw and recant my statement. I will not be leaving a negative review. I just like, I don't know. You get angry and you say stuff and you do stuff and you kind of feel silly. It's amazing. Like life, we're going to get like angry at times. In fact, the scripture is really, really clear that anger itself is, is not a sin. The scripture actually says, do not sin in your anger. Because how many know that there's two types of anger, right? There, there, there's this thing called righteous anger versus unrighteous anger. And righteous anger is when you have control. Unrighteous anger is when your anger has control over you. The jury is still out whether or not I was operating in righteous anger or unrighteous <laughs> anger. But that happens to us. We are human beings who have emotions. I I think sometimes we surprise ourselves. Like we kind of like are hard on ourselves. Like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I have emotions. Well, of course you have emotions. You are created in the image of an emotional God. Maybe this is new for some people that are watching online today, but you should know that your God is emotional. Like all throughout the scriptures, we discover that God, he feels intensely and he feels deeply. Like God feels love. God feels hate. God, the scripture in Exodus says that God is a jealous God. Zephaniah says that God, he, he feels joy. And Genesis talks about the idea that God, he grieves. What a thought that our God, things grieve his spirit. In Psalm chapter 24, you actually, there's actually a scripture that says that God, he's in heaven and he laughs. I think that's pretty cool, right? Like, I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, walk on the streets of gold, I want to like cut up with Jesus and like tell jokes. Like I just, how many know God has a sense of humor? Why do you laugh? Because he laughs. God's heart over and over is moved to compassion. The reason why you have emotions is because you are made in the image of an emotional God. Now we, we need to know, right? That like our emotions are different from God because how many know we have emotions that are flawed by this thing called sin. So, so God is perfect. God is just, God is great. And so our emotions, they differ because our emotions and feelings have been flawed by this depravity called sin and the fact that we've all fallen short of God's glory. But there is this tension. There is this thing that connects us to God that we are reflecting his image and our emotions are a glimpse of his emotions. God is different, right? Because we live in a world right now that our commitments, they change as fast as our feelings do. Come on, there's a lot of people out there, right? Every one of your decisions is about as inconsistent as your emotions. Please understand, this is not how God operates. God is not on an emotional roller coaster that he wakes up one day with an identity crisis going, I don't feel like it anymore. No, no, no. Your God is just, your God is true, your God is good. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. He is stable and he is sturdy. He does not operate out of impulse. He operates and functions out of truth. He he operates out out of truth. But out of all of those emotions and out of all of those feelings, the one I want to lean into today is this idea of what makes God angry? Like, what does God get mad about? And as I'm saying that, many of you are tuning off right now. And you're saying, I'm going to check back in next Sunday for Mother's Day because I got a good hat and I want to hear that message. But before you log off from YouTube, I think you want to stay for a moment because I think you're actually going to be encouraged. 
Mark 11 is a very, very interesting and fascinating story because we see a new side or we see this glimpse. It's a very peculiar story about Jesus because in Mark 11, you're going to witness Jesus get hot. (laughs) He gets upset. He gets angry. What can we learn from it today as we study it? When God gets mad, what is it that we should know? What is it that we should learn? Scripture says in Mark chapter 11, verse 12, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seen in the distance of fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. So just get the context. Jesus is with his disciples. They are moving into Bethany and he is hungry. Jesus is a man and he's all man and he's all God. And so he gets hungry like you and I do. And in the distance, he sees a fig tree and he goes, whoa, this is good. I was looking for something to eat and there's a tree. As he gets close to the tree, he discovers that the tree doesn't have any fruit on it. It just simply has leaves. And when he sees this, it makes him mad. Remember like uh, the vending machine that you were like salivating for a Snickers bar? You're like, I gotta eat, I gotta eat. And all you have is your last dollar and you're in school. And so you put the dollar in and you hit the Snickers button and all of a sudden the Snickers, it drops, but then it gets stuck. You're like, that's, that's all I have. And so, you know, in your depravity, you kick the machine and then you witness and mutter some unholy words not you, but me, and, and, and you get mad and you're upset with the machine. This is in many ways what's taking place right here with Jesus. Except Jesus, he gets to this fig tree and, and, and it's nothing there. And instead he, he looks at the fig tree and he curses the tree. Now a curse is a judgment. Um, it is a declaration of misfortune upon something or someone. Jesus says, uh, you tree, You're not gonna ever produce fruit ever again. Like Jesus is personal with the tree. He's like, he's calling the tree like you. Like you aren't gonna produce anything ever again. But when Jesus does it, he doesn't just kick the machine. No, he actually is the son of God. And there is a supernatural thing taking place. He says, you will never produce fruit ever again. How many know only God can do that? Only God can do that. I can try to curse that vending machine all I want. Doesn't matter. It's gonna keep on going, keep having a life. But when Jesus says something, Something changes. Scholars have talked about this moment because this is a peculiar glimpse of Jesus because we see Jesus cursing something. In fact, it's the only miracle in the gospels that we know as a destructive miracle. So people have debated because it feels opposite to his character. It feels opposite to his nature. I mean, his most famous sermon is the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about eight different blessings. Jesus isn't known for cursing, he's known for blessing. It almost seems like a waste of supernatural power. What, what's, what's taking place here? Why is he so angry at the fig tree? We're gonna answer that, but before we do, I think it's important that we have a caveat statement. So please write this down. This is a caveat for everybody out there on church online. Please hear me today. Just because God corrects you doesn't mean that he curses you. Can we just inhale that for a moment? because there's already somebody that's creating their own narrative and their own story about God, but you need to hear me really clearly. There are a lot of people in 2021 that keep on mistaking God's discipline as God's destruction. No, friend, God, he disciplines us often, but he doesn't discipline you to hurt you. He disciplines to help you. It is not God's desire to punish you. It's God's desire to protect you. This is what he wants to do in our life. He is a good father. But many times someone gets corrected by God and they go, oh, God's cursed me. God's written me off. God doesn't want me. God's excluded me. It is quite the opposite. Yeah, it's funny. Um, It's ironic, actually. Uh, That couch and that furniture finally came in. Can you believe it? It came after six months of waiting. It's like, yippee, this is, you know, I was like, honestly, the year of Lord's favor. Like it was a special moment. And uh, the, the couch got in, I put it in the house. And literally I took Dawn Cherie, this is last week. I took her away for three nights on a little getaway, just little baby moon, just me and her taking off, getting away. I come home. First day back, I walk into my house. Brand new couch, I've been waiting for six months. Walk over to the couch, see my boys. Hey boys, daddy's home. Walk over to the couch, get to the end of the couch. Sharpie marker all over the brand new couch. Oh man, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. 
God will always get the last laugh. I was hot again. Who did this? I said, Wyatt, get over here right now. Cause I knew it was Wyatt. He said, he looked at me and he already knew. He said, no dad, he already had an alibi. He said, no dad. He said, no dad, Wyatt did it. I said, I said, son, who drew on this couch? He said, Wyatt did it. I said, son, look at me right now. Who drew on, you, who drew on it? He said, Wyatt did it. Well, I was even more angry that Wyatt had done it because Wyatt's one and a half. What am I gonna do to Wyatt, you know? I'm like, yo, Wyatt, this really disappoints me. He's like, ah, he doesn't, he doesn't say nothing. I'm like, dog, it's not even cool, bro. I'm like, back here. Can't get angry. Ain't no one to get angry at, man. So I gave a whole speech. I'm like, this is not what we do with our property, okay? Dad's been waiting for this property. This is last Sunday. Last Sunday, I get up. I go to church before church. I go get a workout in. I'm driving home from church before church. This is before last Sunday, driving in. I get a text from Don Tree. She said, I'm sorry to upset you more, but your son Wyatt lied to you. I said, what you mean? She said, he was the one who drew on the couch. I talked to the babysitter. The babysitter said that she was holding wild the entire time. And when she saw the Sharpie, she looked at Wyatt and Wyatt ran and he went to his closet and he cried. He not only lied about it, he also blamed his brother. I said, we got Genesis three, four and five taking place right here. I said, what are we gonna do with this? This is not okay. This is in my house. This is in my house. On Sunday, oh, the devil is messing with me. The devil is messing with me. And so I, I, I came and I came home. I said, Wyatt, did you lie to me? He said, no. I mean, I interrogated this boy. I said, did you lie to me? No, dad, no, Wyatt, Wyatt did, Wyatt did it. I was like, all right, all right, I'm gonna get double confirmation when I get to church. And so I left it alone. I came to church. We talked to the babysitter, Tessa. We discovered that he is lying. In between the A block and the B block, I got Wyatt into my church office. And let's just say we had a time of prayer together. <laughs> Discipline that boy. You say, Rich, why did you, why did you, discipline him. Did you discipline him because you want to punish him? No, no, no. It's quite the opposite. I did not punish Wyatt because I want to hurt Wyatt. I punished Wyatt because I want him to grow. I want him to be all that God's called him to be. So important you understand this. Discipline is short-term pain for a long-term gain. I wasn't trying, I was trying to not destroy Wyatt. I, I wanted to destroy lying that Wyatt was doing. Because how, how many know, like, this is just how it works. Like, if I don't come against this thing and teach him this right now, this thing lying is going to mess him up in life. Like, 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 it's just the reality of it is, like, son, you got to learn. You, you're going to actually have to learn. And the only way you're going to learn is that you're going to have to have some short-term pain, but it will be a long-term game. But if you don't learn this lesson, lying will destroy you. Like if he goes to school and he lies, they're going to kick him out. If he has his friends and he lies, yo, they're going to disown him. If he gets married and lies, his spouse is going to leave him. If he goes to his job and lies, they're going to fire him. If he grows up in society and lies on his taxes, they're going to arrest him. So either I discipline my son or he is going to jail. <laughs> How many know that time out pales in comparison to the long-term pain of not discovering the lesson? I don't know about you, but I would rather be corrected. See, I want to destroy lying in Wyatt's life before lying destroys Wyatt's life. And God, he, he disciplines us in order to destroy anything that does not bear fruit. Hear me loud and clear. God destroys it before it destroys you. Come on, is there anybody out there that would say, God, I am open to your correction. God, I want your discipline. God, make me into the man. Make me into the woman that you have created me to be. I'm not running from it. I'm not avoiding it. I understand it's the only way I get stronger. So, so please, caveat statement, please do not mistake God's correction for God's curse. It's like, like, just, that's not what's taking place. A curse is something far different. God is not trying to curse you. God came to save you. 
So, so what, 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 what's, what's going on? Because this is, this is strange, right? Here's Jesus, he's, he's hangry. He's hungry and he can't get food and he curses the fig tree. And, and people, they can't figure it out. It's like, it's been debated. I heard it talked about it in Bible college all the time. I've heard so many different perspectives on it. I mean, one of the things that's so peculiar about it is that like literally it says right there in Mark chapter 11, verse 13, it, it was not the season for figs. It was not the season for figs. So it almost seems unjust. Why are you angry at the fig tree? It's not season for the figs. What's taking place here? Is, is Jesus, is he, um, is he out of control in his anger? Is he unjust in his anger? Well, the answer I believe is no. He, he's God and he's perfect and he's just and there's a point to it. Let me just give you um, two quick thoughts around the fig tree. The thought number one that we must put into context here is that we know the, the, the time in which this takes place. This is Holy Week. So, so this is the week the last few chapters here of Mark, as we're into Mark 11 here now, this is all the week that Jesus goes to the cross. So what we know is we know that Jesus went to the cross. When did he go to the cross? He went to the cross during Passover. Yep. Passover lands March and April. What we know about fig trees is we know that fig trees, they begin to have fruit show up in March or April. And so what we know about the fig tree is that in March or April, fruit begins to show. Harvest season is not until August. So it could be easily interpreted that when Mark says it's not in season for the figs, what he simply means is that it's not in harvest for the figs. But Jesus is not cursing the tree because it's not in harvest. He's cursing the tree because there's nothing on the tree. Yep. Nothing, zero, nada. Nothing, there's, there's nothing on there. He's not saying that there's something, I don't like what I see. There is no fruit at all. In fact, Mark chapter 11, verse 13, it says, when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves. What's interesting about the fig tree is that the fig tree grows fruit first and leaves second. So the fact that he shows up and he sees the leaves, but no fruit, there is something going on here. When God comes and looks at your life, he is looking for fruit, ladies and gentlemen. This is why Galatians chapter five says, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. You wanna know what kind of fruit God is looking for? There is nine specific fruit that if your life is led by the spirit, there ought to be some evidence of fruit in your life. Something, something. But it's not just in Galatians, the scripture says, that Jesus, he says, you will know them by their fruit in Matthew 7. I don't know who you are, but at some point, fruit has to show up. At some point. John 15, Jesus said, every branch that does not bear fruit, I will cut off. I will cut off. Uh, there's some people watching online right now and you're still surprised that you were rejected by that school. Can I just encourage you? It was nothing but leaves. Some of you still crying over that relationship that was cut off. Didn't you know it was nothing but leaves? Some of you are wondering, why did the business fail? It was nothing but leaves. Some of you are wondering, why did that dream die? Because that dream was nothing but leaves. It kind of looked the part, but it didn't have any fruit. And God says, I need you to give me something. Something. Just, just something. When God comes and looks at your life, does he find fruit or nothing but leaves? Nothing but leaves. Nothing but leaves. It's about fruit, ladies and gentlemen. The fig tree should have had something on it, but it had nothing. But it wasn't just that we know the season. Secondly, we know that Jesus is a prophet. And so what do prophets do? We see this all throughout the Old Testament. Prophets over and over again, they give these things called object lessons. Remember Amos, he does this with the plumb line that they use an object to teach a lesson. And this is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is using the fig tree as an object of hypocrisy. Well, there it is. You wanna know what makes Jesus mad? You wanna know what God gets hot about? He gets angry about hypocrisy. He gets angry when we claim to have the truth, but we don't walk in honesty. When we act and behave like we don't need the grace of God. This is the definition of a Pharisee. 
And mind you, if you wanna see when God gets mad, just look at any time that Jesus is walking and talking to Pharisees. This is what he says in Matthew 27, verse 28 to the Pharisees. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. What is he saying? He's saying, practice what you preach or change your speech. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you want to know what frustrates me? You want to know what God gets mad about? He gets mad when we behave like we don't need him. When we act like we've got it all together, we are truth tellers, but we're actually walking in dishonesty. And here is a fig tree that is meant to produce fruit, but the fig tree, when he gets close to it, all it has is leaves and he's using it as an object lesson for each and every one of us that if you keep living life like that, in the end, all that will fall upon your life is a curse. Because the only way you can be blessed is when you actually come out from under the cover and you actually show who you actually are, not who you're pretending to be. God says, quit faking it. And if you'll stop faking it, I'm gonna help you make it. People make me laugh though, right? Cause like I, oh, I meet people and I love our church. We're constantly inviting people to church and I'll invite people to church. People are like, yo man, I'd come to church, but yo, but like the thing about church, I don't like going to church cause it's full of hypocrites. To which I always say, well, There's always room for one more. (laughs) Yes, you are right. Church is full of hypocrites. Oh my goodness. You are right. 8 billion people on the planet, 16 billion different faces. Humanity is flawed. Humanity is full of sin. The church is full of sinners. In fact, it is the only organization in the entire world that I am aware of that says the only way you can qualify to be a part of this organization is that you have to be a sinner. So can I encourage some people right now? When I'm talking about hypocrisy, I'm not talking about never messing up. I'm not talking about never failing. No, I want to encourage you today that if you are in Christ Jesus, he is still working on you. He is still building you. He is still growing you. We have to admit that we're sinners. Yet I like what R.C. Sproul says, the great reformed theologian. He says it this way. He says, all hypocrites are sinners, but not all sinners are hypocrites. See, hypocrisy is intentionally projecting that which you are not. And the problem with this is that the reason why Jesus came to this earth was to meet you in your sin and to save you from it. You don't have to have everything. You have to have something. You know what the something is that you have to offer God? Get ready. You have to say, I got something. I I got some sin. I don't measure up. I can't do it. I need your help. I need your help. And the reason why the fig tree is being cursed is because it should have fruit, but it didn't have any fruit. And now Jesus, the prophet, is using it as an object lesson to tell us a story 2,000 years later that this thing, because it's projecting one thing, but it's not doing that which it projects, it will not be blessed. Instead, it will be cut off. And Jesus, the prophet, it's so beautiful. This is called the sandwich effect that Mark does. And we're gonna see it in a moment. Mark will sandwich two stories. He'll start one story, stop it, and he's gonna come back to it. He go, and it almost feels like, is this, does this matter? Does this go to, he does it all throughout the gospel of Mark. He's doing the sandwich effect. Right now. He started a story in the fig tree. And now the scripture says, as he curses the fig tree, this is what happens in Mark chapter 11, verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So we see Jesus, the prophet, and he is gone from cursing the tree. And now he's moved into Jerusalem, the place that he will be betrayed and crucified. But before he is betrayed and crucified, he curses the tree and now he's cleansing the temple. 
He's cleansing the temple. And so he comes to the temple and you remember, it's Passover season. So you just gotta, you gotta know the context. Otherwise it doesn't have nearly as much potency and power. It's Passover season, which means that people have come on pilgrimages all around the world because they're coming to the temple. The temple was the center of society, culturally, spiritually, economically. It's where life took place. It was the center of the city. And from all over the world, Jews have come and they've come to do what? To make a sacrifice. Because there is this system of how they can be forgiven, which is lamb's blood must be shed. And so people are hustling and bustling. And that time period, just the practicality of it is that merchants would set up and priests would set up. And they would set up in the, the court of the Gentiles. And men and women would, would come and before they go into the temple, they would need to get a lamb or they would need to get a dove. And so they would sell a lamb or sell a dove right there. The historian Josephus tells us exactly how lucrative this business was, that in that same year that this takes place, 255,000 lambs were slaughtered. I want you to catch the magnitude of what's taking place. So people would come and they would, they would need to buy an, an animal to sacrifice. And Jesus, when, when he gets there to this scene and he's walking around, he gets angry again. He gets mad by what he sees. It's important that you understand this because he's not mad about what they are doing. He's mad about how they are doing it. So just before you like leave here at Somi and like go into our resource corner and start tearing down church merch and burn it, that's not what's taking place. I can already see somebody, I can already see that place getting turned upside down. No, it's not the what, it's the how. These were all good functions that needed to take place, but Jesus knew their hearts. He knew their intention. Everything about the gospel is the motivation and the intention of your heart. And one day we will stand before a righteous God and there before him, we will discover what our motivation and what our heart is. How many know you can do a good thing for the wrong reasons? You can serve for all the wrong reasons. You can give for all the wrong reasons. You can be in church for all the wrong reasons. How many know just because you're in church doesn't mean you're in Christ? God cares about why. God cares about the motivation. And when Jesus shows up, he gets angry because quickly he discerns the motivation and the intention of the people that they're going through the motions and they're just doing it and they're just going through it, but there is evil and corruption in their heart. First thing that he's frustrated about is that he's mad about the evil of extortion. You see these merchants and priests, history would tell us that they were selling lambs and doves for 15 times the amount of what it cost. In particular, you'll notice in the text that Jesus, it doesn't say anything about the lambs. All it talks about in the text is that Jesus, he gets upset and he sees them and he shouts at them. And when he's there, he says this, he says that he turns over the money changers and the bench of those selling doves. Everyone say doves. Why? Because doves were the poor man's sacrifice. Leviticus chapter five, verse seven, it says, anyone who cannot afford a lamb is to bring two doves or two young pigeons to the Lord. And so Jesus sees this and he's going, you're selling doves at a premium? You're profiting off of people's desire for forgiveness and for healing? You're profiting off of people that wanna come and be uncovered and say, God, could you cover me? You're profiting off of somebody who's exposing their heart and saying, this is who I actually am. I'm flawed and I have issues, but I need the covering of God. You're gonna take a profit off of that? And it makes Jesus mad. Not on my watch. Good news is, is if you can't afford a dove, there is a lamb who says, I will freely lay down my life and I will freely give myself for it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so when you can't afford a dove, come on somebody, the lamb of God says, I will lay my life down. He's turning over the dove tables and he's turning over money changers, not on my watch. But he's not just mad about the extortion. He's mad of this culture of exclusivity. It's interesting because where Jesus disrupts the temple, 
He doesn't disrupt on the inside. He doesn't disrupt in the holiest of holies. No, he is in this area called the court of Gentiles. You see, it's always been the heart of God, just so you know, it has always been the heart of God that all nations would be blessed. It's always been his desire that he would pour out his spirit on all people. In fact, all the way back to the covenant with Abraham, he said, Abraham, you will be a blessing to all nations. So even when the temple was designed, as you go through the temple of design, there is this area at the temple called the court of Gentiles because it's this sacred space where those that are not Jews, those that were not born into the family, those that are not in the bloodline, that they can still come and gather around at a distance to the presence of God, to come and be near the courts. Jesus, he sees what's taking place and he says, I'm gonna turn up and I'm gonna get hot and I'm gonna get upset right here in the temple, right here in the court of the Gentiles because he is saying to them, oh, I know Jews, you thought the Messiah was going to come and cleanse the temple of Gentiles, but it's quite the contrary. I have come to cleanse the temple for the Gentiles. Come on, is there anybody thankful that God, he, he cleansed the temple for you? What does Jesus say? He says, is it not written? My house is a house of prayer for all nations, for all nations. I pray this is always the heart of Vu Church. I pray that our church would be more inclusive than we are exclusive. I'm glad we got people sitting in rows on this Sunday, but what I really get excited about is when these rows turn into circles. We call them crews here at Vu Church. This week right here locally, it is crew fair weekend where people are finding a small group or they're finding a place where someone's gonna know their name, let them know that they are needed and known. Even you online right now watching, you don't have to go through life all alone. You don't have to feel like you're on the outskirts, like you don't belong. There is a crew for you. Maybe my favorite little poem from Edwin Markham says this. It says, he drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. And Jesus got angry and Jesus got upset because he looked at the system of religion that was corrupt and says, you are exploiting and you are extorting people who desire to come and uncover their sin and you are keeping those out that don't look like you and talk like you and are not a part of your bloodline and I just want to remind you that I am the God of all nations and I've come here today to turn some tables upside down that you might recognize that now all because of the shed blood of the lamb they all have access into the presence of God you don't have to stand on the outskirts you don't have to stand in the distance you can come near you can draw near to the presence of God You don't need a priest. You don't need a man. You have the one man, Jesus. Jesus, he curses the tree and he cleanses the temple. It's a picture of when God gets mad. The scripture says in Mark chapter 11, verse 20, in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said, Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Jesus' response, have faith in God. He curses the tree, he cleanses the temple to change their hearts. It's amazing because as Peter sees this, it's almost like he's surprised. Jesus, yo, look, look what you said happened. Look, the fig trees withered from the roots. See, the, the cleansing of the temple and the cursing of the fig tree is an announcement from Jesus that anything that is not rooted in me will wither away. And when Peter says, look, Something else is taking place. Faith is rising up inside of him for his heart is being changed. And when Peter is seeing the withered fig tree, he's not just seen with his physical eyesight, but rather he's seen for the first time with his heart. Did you know that your heart can see? 
Paul the Apostle, he writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Who believe? Who simply believe? Rabbi, look, the fig tree has withered from the roots. Jesus is saying, I know because I said it and anything I say, I will do. And that temple that's been standing there for all that time, it's about to wither away as well. And I'm about to unlock a brand new temple. And that temple is right there in your heart. For I will be cursed on a tree that I might cleanse your temple, that your heart might be changed, that I might dwell inside of you. How's this happen? Jesus did the work cursed on a tree so that your temple, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, could be cleansed so that your heart could be changed, that your eyes of your heart might be enlightened to know the riches of his glory, to know the wonder of the cross. How's this happen? Have faith in God. I don't know. I just, I just sense it right now so clearly. There's someone who's watching right now and you think God's mad at you and you've got it all wrong. He's not mad at you, he's mad about you. He invites you, put your faith, put your trust in Jesus. He is upset of the system of religion that puts a burden on people's back and he came to turn the whole thing upside down and he now declares that if you are in him, guess what? Because he was cursed on a cross 2000 years ago, he took your death that you might receive his life and now because of it you have been washed by the blood of the lamb and the temple of your soul has been cleansed and now he dwells inside of you so that your heart might see and that your heart might be changed he's not mad at you he's mad about you and i just want to declare over the vu community that we are a church of authentic people that we're not putting on appearances we're not hoping god will bless our pretend self or our fake self. We're not going through the motions of church. We understand that we are who we are by the grace of God. And today, I believe that when you come with your authentic broken self, there's a blessing from God. How do you get it? You have faith in Him. You put your trust in Him. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He he wants to bless you. He loves you. He's not mad at you today. He's mad at the sin that keeps us from him. He's not cursing you. He's correcting you most likely. He's not punishing you. He he, he wants to protect you. He's not destroying you today. He's disciplining you. He's saying, quit putting on the appearances. I just need you. I just need something. I just need something. You have access. You don't have to stand on the outskirts. You have access. He's mad about you today. Would you stand to your feet all over this room and maybe even right there at church online, we're just gonna take a moment. Just sense the power of the Holy Spirit here. Can we just lift our hands towards heaven? Can we just take a moment right now? God, today, Lord, we've come not with our projected self, but with our real self. God, would you enlighten the eyes of our heart today? Would you change our heart? You curse the tree, you cleanse the temple, you change their hearts. You curse the tree, you cleanse the temple, you you change their hearts. And today, Jesus, we, we want a heart change. We want to be transformed. We want a new perspective. We want to see that anything, Lord, that's not rooted in you will never bear fruit. We're not looking for religion today. We're not looking to keep up appearances today. God, we've come into this place once again, admitting who we are, that we are flawed, that we are impaired, that we have issues, but we stand before a righteous and holy God. And the reason why we have boldness and the reason why we have confidence is not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus has done. So we believe Jesus. We put our faith in God today. 
Not faith in faith, but faith in God. He's gonna come through for you. You can trust Him at His word. What He said to you, He will fulfill. Don't you give up now. Don't you quit now. Don't you begin to believe a false narrative. Don't begin to tell yourself that God's angry with you and mad at you. No, He's he's wanting you right now to come to Him. He wants to bless you. He wants to save you. He wants to rescue you. You're not giving up. You're not quitting. He's not mad at you, friend. He's madly in love with you. Put your faith in God. Can we just take a moment today, wherever you're at, in your home, right here at Somi? Come on, can we just shed off the appearances for a moment? Can we check our heart for a moment? Can we remind ourselves why we're here? Why God brought us to this moment? It wasn't what they were doing, it's how they were doing it. How they were doing it. Their heart, He wants to change the heart. He wants to change the motivation. He wants to change the intention. God, check our motivations, God. You know what makes Him angry? False humility. Some of you out there right now, you're telling yourself, I'm not enough. I'm just less than. Come on, quit lying to yourself. Quit walking and fall. You are a mighty man of valor. Come on, you're a woman of God. The dream he gave you, it's no little thing. It's something big. Walk in confidence. Know who you are. Walk in boldness. Oh, come on, can you lift your hands? I just want to be where you are. Come on, can we just get close to him? I just want to be where you are. Hey, Rich Wilkerson here. I want to say a big thank you for watching today's content, believing and trusting that it impacted you. And if it did help you or it encouraged in any way, I would love for you to like it and share it with some other people. Make sure to subscribe to the VU Church YouTube page where you can get more content just like this. And while you're there, go peruse the gallery, as they say, and see past talks and past content that I believe is gonna help you. I love you. Best is yet to come.